Welcome to San Francisco Ballet's virtual Meet the Artist interview. My name is Claire Sheridan, and I'm here today with Teet Kelemans. He's a dancer with a San Francisco Ballet, principal dancer, and uh, I'd like to welcome you, Teet. Hi, everybody. Now, Teet was born in Estonia, and uh, he began his career with the Estonian National Ballet, danced in England with the Birmingham Royal, and then he joined San Francisco Ballet uh, as a principal in 2005. So happy 15 year anniversary. Oh, thank you so much. Now, normally I'd be interviewing you in front of the stage of the War Memorial Opera House before a performance. Uh, but due to COVID-19, the Opera House uh, was suddenly closed on March 7th, almost nine weeks ago. And uh, the shelter in place mandate went into effect. So Teet, I'd like to ask you, how did you how do you feel? How did you feel when you found out that San Francisco Ballet had to cancel its five remaining programs this season? That's almost 40 performances, I believe. Yes. Um, I think the best way I can explain it is like somebody pulls the carpet out of your feet, oh. below your feet. It was just, it was devastating. Um, what tends to happen is we sort of build up the resistance throughout our year and we we train vigorously to keep up the energy that it's going to take to last for five months of the year and dance constantly and in top on your top form and so you're saving these pockets of energy and you just containing it you don't release it all at once you're just containing it and so that you can slowly get through the whole entire season and and when we heard that evening uh, when we opened up which i was very fortunate to be part of that show i i danced green leaf uh, i was a partner for yuan yuan tan and Midsummer Night's Dream. That was a Midsummer Night's Dream, yes. And uh, at the end of the show, we were told that, um, in fact, we're not going to be continuing. And you could just see that kind of shock in everybody's faces and the same feeling, like exactly what I was experiencing, that kind of feeling. Wait a second, is this for real? Is this really just happening? Are we really just asked to leave the theater and not be here? And um, it was just uh, such confusion and loss and uh, sadness and um, just questions, questions, questions. Well, now that we're two months in, what are you missing from your professional life right now? I, I miss that kind of day-to-day -day interaction. I, I, miss the training. I miss being able to move and uh, not just be uh, confined in a small pa place. I, I sort of feel like a like when you catch a firefly and put it in a jar and you just kind of like bounce up against those walls. I, I, I mean it has its own charm certainly and it's fun at times and I just laugh when I kick furniture when I do crumpa mass or when I dance. I just try to look at the positive side, but I certainly miss moving big. I, that is the one thing that I really love about San Francisco Ballet is their, their studio size and their stage is so huge and you can really just expand yourself through your dance and I just miss that. I understand that your daughter Chloe did get a chance to perform with you in a Midsummer Night's Dream before the run was canceled. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and in her training? Oh, yes. Thankfully, she got to perform that same day that we did our opening night. She got to perform as a, um, a page boy for T T Tanya. And um, it was an early show. It was a 10, 10 a.m. show, 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. show. And and we had to get up really early and I got her to the theater and I was doing Theseus myself in that show. And then in the evening show, I did Green Leaf and, and uh, I saw it and she did amazingly. And I was so glad that she had that experience because also during the Nutcracker, she got to be one of these um, little kids 
in the second act uh, with Mother Ginger. And so it, it was a big deal for her to have two shows in one year. How old is your daughter? She turned 10 years old in January. So what are you learning about being a dad to a 10 year old? It's fun. It's really fun. I actually, uh, I have to say that during the season, usually I don't get to be at home very much. I am mostly tied to the uh, opera house and my rehearsals start in the middle of the day and end up going until 11 o'clock in the evening. It's, it's, um, I miss my family a lot during the season. And, um, and so now actually having during this time to be with my family, it's, uh, it's sort of a gift. And how are you and Chloe staying in shape during this uh, stay at home? Well, but the great thing is that it didn't even occur to her once that she couldn't do ballet. So um, I immediately realized that this, I anticipated that this might be a longer wait. And so uh, our stage managers, uh, I spoke with the stage manager and and I got a ballet bar and, and took that ballet bar home. And um, Chloe right away was interested in doing ballet class. And now we have ballet floor, thanks from uh, San Francisco Ballet. And uh, Chloe has been taking, the day we stopped, she's been taking ballet class every day. I think there's only was two days that she took off the entire time. She's been taking the class the entire time. And these are virtual classes offered by the San Francisco Ballet School? Yes. And um, when they're not offered ballet classes, we do our own. Uh-huh. You and your mm -hmm. wife, Molly. Yes. With a former dancer. We, we trade off. We trade off. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, San Francisco Ballet has been offering uh, classes on, online, the school has, and also company class has been streamed. Um, I've got to give kudos to the ballet masters and to dance teachers all over the world who have made their classes virtual and adapted them to fit into the, uh, the dancer's living room or dancer's kitchen. And, you know, training and teaching this way is no easy task. And I just want to say God bless them because I'm sure like you mentioned, there's been a lot of chairs kicked over and people falling over sofas and so forth, but they're all trying so hard to make it work. Um, Nevertheless, Tita, I was wondering if you could give some words of comfort to uh, serious young dancers who are really nervous about this interruption to their in-studio dance training. Yes, I, I actually have to say um, the same thing about the teachers too, um, because they have been extremely accommodating and keep advising us to be safe and, and not do things too much. And um, the, the, it, it is a certainly a new, uh, new learning curve for everybody. But what I could say for the students is, I know that this time is very uncertain. We don't know when we're gonna be back. Even us professionals, we don't know what, what we're gonna be back, but especially to the students who are just starting out who have job offers or we're waiting to hear about the contract this is this is a very scary time but um you know trust your your mentors trust the teachers they will give you the best training that you need and they will support you and at the end of the day eventually this is going to stop and you will get back into the studio and you will see, even if you feel out of shape right now, or maybe not able to know, even if you are in shape, you will see that the energy of the group will lift you up. You will feel lifted and you will be able to move again. And, and as I said before, we are all in the same place. Nobody is somehow getting in ahead of anybody. We're all just starting from the same place, coming back together. And you will see that the, it's the group energy that is going to lift you up again. And within a month or so, you won't even feel the difference anymore. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so how else are you spending your time these days? Uh, well, I, I, I take a class every day and 
it just depends on uh, my floor is very very hard and uh, I can't take the camera outside. Some people have t told me, maybe you should just take it outside, you know, in sneakers, jump around. I have a, a slope in my garden and I, I can't do anything on that slope and nor do I really want to. And uh, in the living room, so I have to take a one day off sort of to keep myself in, in so that I don't, I don't break basically. Yes. And, but uh, I have, Actually, in two weeks, I'm gonna try to present my my thesis. Uh, I am taking my my uh, I'm getting my MFA from the Academy of Arts University, and it's in 3D animation. And I have to present it in two weeks. So right now, I'm in a process of getting my thesis book together and supporting materials. And hopefully, if I do this well, I will get my uh, MFA. Congratulations. Academics has always been important to you. You've, in fact, you've, you've been involved in many, many things. You have diverse interests. I know you've done art installations and you've done work with nonprofits and you've um, uh, gotten your BA through, through the LEAP program. So it, it's very difficult to dance professionally and also be involved in, in, in all these academics. How did you get through that and what's helping you to get through this MFA process? I, I just love learning in general, and and I'm very I'm very curious about the things that I find interesting. So I want to I want to experience them firsthand. Like for instance, I I love film in general, and and through the Academy of Arts, I've had the fortune to learn all about, there is to learn about film, of how to create film from beginning to the very end and the process of, of filmmaking in general. And also I love animation. My, my daughter watched her whole entire childhood, 3D cartoons, and I never really appreciated what it took to actually do a 3D animation and besides even the animation of all the other aspects of lighting and modeling and all of this stuff that goes into that um, filmmaking and and I've always just kind of been curious and when you're curious and kind of passionate about it you don't really notice how hard it is you sort of just go with it and I've been dancing professional for 24 years now so I know that the performance aspect is not gonna be a um, reinventing or I have to somehow give up everything to focus on it. In my earlier career, yes, I did have to focus on it. I did have to put my 100% into my performance. There was no time for anything else, but after you've done it for 24 years, you certainly know, okay, now I have three hours. Now I must get ready for the show. But before those three hours, I can devote to schoolwork without feeling the pressure of the show. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's, that's how I do it. I often in between uh, intermissions, I often check in my schoolwork again. I, I, I keep busy and it also keeps my brain sort of healthy and functioning. You've also been creating some uh, video content for San Francisco Ballet. Can you talk a little bit about that? You did a choreographic chain letter and uh, some partnering videos and... Yeah, I, I, I just wanna help our organization out and our organization has been amazing, especially in this time of crisis, how it became very, very clear that they are not going to um, um, sacrifice the dancers and not gonna cut our salaries and put us on layoff. They kept us on all full salaries. They honored our contract and they worked so hard endlessly of trying to meet those gaps and losing the audience. And there was constant feedback through our um, um, executive director, Kelly Tweedale and Helgi of telling that Dancers, you are safe, you have this job security, you are the most, our biggest priority. And it just, 
it's just distilled this comfort in us knowing it isn't just a ballet company that you go to work for. These people actually care about you. They treat you like a family because this is what you would do for somebody who you truly love and respect. And they really just did an amazing job of keeping us all calm. And I, I just felt so much love towards this company that I was thinking, well, I will do anything. I will do anything for this company. I will get as creative as I have to be. And I will try to include as many dancers as I can think of. And this, this time I just want to dedicate all my creative resources towards this company. So I decided to have a, a film sequential that sort of gives us an opportunity to sort of link up, even though we're very confined and staying safe indoors. And, and it was a, it was a fun project. It got everybody sort of out of that little dark phase for a while and lifted everybody up. And um, as of today, I don't know if you saw, we presented that link to another company and New York City Ballet created on top of that. So Can New York- Can you explain the, what, the, the premise of the chain letter? So it's, 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 it basically is following, uh, each dancer has a, a roughly about 10 seconds to do dance moves, whatever they chose to do. And they can choose to wear point shoes or flat shoes or sneakers or whatever it is in their house. And they get to improvise and what, wherever they finish, the next dancer would pick up from that. And uh, I think uh, this, was a, this was an old film style that Buster Keaton mm -hmm. kind of started this trend and other filmmakers have, have uh, uh, elaborated on that trend, but it was inspired from him. And, and it's, it sort of just carries on and dancers have the freedom and they don't have to learn any choreography. They just showing off, having fun, finding a good scenery to, uh, to dance in front of. And New York City Ballet, it was so exciting. I hope that you get to see it. The New York City Ballet responded and it was phenomenal. Phenomenal, where, absolutely phenomenal. Where can we see this? This is uh, right now up on social media. It's, um, it's just came up today, the 7th of May. And New York, it's on New York City Ballet social media as well. And it's it is- Sequentia. Sequentia and it's full of energy and besides of our principal dancers, you get to see New York City Ballet uh, principal dancers, just to mention a few like Ashley Bowder, Tyler Peck, uh, Sarah Mearns. Yeah. Fantastic. Well done. Mm -hmm. um, here's a general question. We were, when you're also, we were talking about um, going to school. Do you think in general that successful ballet dancers share certain character traits or uh, values, like you have to be self-directed, you have to be a perfectionist. Is there something that you all share? I think that we, we, understand, we understand the value of hard work. Mm -hmm. I would say that is something that really shines through every ballet dancer and everybody obviously learns differently. But I, I knew myself like if there was something that I didn't understand, I didn't, uh, I didn't sort of shut down because dancers were very also very social, so we ask questions and we we go to the next person. Hey, do you, how even in our ballet studio when we're learning choreography, we might go to the next person and say, how do you do this step? Can you teach it to me? So we figure it out. We sort it out ourselves. The ballet master doesn't need to be constantly feeding us the choreography, but we can get it from somebody who really quickly got it, or maybe who has done this previously. And uh, they share the information with us and we can all move together as a group forward. And the same thing sort of happens, I feel, in uh, students, uh, ballet dancers who become students later, they just constantly push forward, constantly find a way to get their work in. I have, I don't know any, any dancers who have uh, given up or left the work on a side. They just push through it. I, I see 
in, uh, my, I, I always study between rehearsals and uh, performances. I have the same thing happens with everybody. Our, our, our lounge in our belly is filled with books and people on the computers working away on their papers. And it's, it's really refreshing to see how many young dancers are curious about learning and educating themselves. It's fascinating. Uh, you've danced many um, lead roles in uh, various story ballets, Albrecht and Giselle, Siegfried and Swan Lake, and The Prince and the Little Mermaid. Um, I know you put a lot of thought and understanding into uh, develop, understanding those characters. What's your approach when you dance an abstract or contemporary storyless piece that doesn't have a character that you can delve into? It's challenging. It's really challenging. You, uh, I feel like I, I sometimes have a choice of thinking, well, what is, what is, what is, what is really important about this piece? If, if I, for instance, if I approach Palanchin, Palanchin piece, I try to, I try to sort of take the back seat and I try not to be um, pushing my idea forward. I try to give the, the, the jewel of the ballet is my partner. She's in front of me and I try to present her as best as I can, really just devoting to all my attention towards her and sort of trying to hit the same lines or same angles behind her so that I almost disappear. And I, 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 try, I try to do that because I, I feel like it's, um, especially I, I just make this choice that it's not about me. It's really just, um, our unison coming together and she is really just what what you see most but in other in other abstract works i i was brought up with with classical ballet and story ballet so there was always something stirring behind and there was always some kind of a story happening behind and it is very challenging to sometimes be told by the choreographer to not put so much focus on a character or to try to be natural or normal and uh, not to emote too much. It is extremely hard and to find that balance where, where is it acceptable? Is this much acceptable? Is that much acceptable? Trying to find that out. And it really doesn't, at least, that has been the hardest challenge is to, to not push that character forward or to not um, emote strongly, obviously, to the audience. But there's always a sort of a, at least for me, there's always a little story underneath it all. It's, there is just a tiny bit of message and maybe I'll, I'll keep that message really natural and really uh, true to myself and that maybe I won't make it as obvious to the audience as I would otherwise, but I'm just, I'm going to just keep it like 45% that message inside me and I just figure it out where it makes sense to me, where it's not blatantly obvious that I'm doing it to the audience. So I'm finding that tricky balance is really hard. Well, going back to when you first arrived in San Francisco in 2005, how, has you, how have you changed as, a, as, a, as an artist? You mentioned um, you, you're not so obsessed you know, before uh, a performance as you, you maybe were when you were younger, but how have you changed? I would have to say the first five years were definitely a kind of pinch me moments. Like, is this really happening? Am I really a principal dancer in San Francisco Ballet is how I am so fortunate. And, and, and uh, the way I also approached work was very 100% every day. And it sort of broke me for a while. It, it, it um, got me injured at times and in a way that was just surprising to me just because I was loving it so much I really just put all of my energy into dancing and and I, I learned with those five years to sort of back off not everything needs 100% there are certain you know things that don't need you to dance 100% not at least every day 
when you perform, yes, but you don't have to do that all the time in a studio. You can give yourself an easy day and just learning my limits, really. And, um, but yeah, the first five years, I was like, I, 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 I couldn't believe that I'd gotten so lucky and um, to join this company. And truly, it was really just shocking how much talent was in this company. I, I would watch these other people perform and I would think, how on earth is this person doing this? I, I could not, I, w I was fortunate enough to see Yuri dance, Yuri Posokhov dance. You know, I got to see Damien, Steven Legate, um, Nicola Blanc, obviously Jean Bada, Gennady Nitzvigen, Pascal Mola, all of these unbelievable dancers. And, and I, I learned so much, but in the way I, I realized that everybody, there is, there is a place for everybody. We all bring something. We all bring something that is unique and we need to cherish that. We shouldn't try to copy somebody. We can appreciate it, but you shouldn't become a carbon copy of somebody else. It's, it's important to remember that you are here because of your talents and what you bring to dance. It's not because you are looking like somebody else. And so that was the most important message, but it, it, it was a sh certainly joining the company taught me that I had not even reached my limits and mostly just uh, referring to uh, modern dance and new creations or how far to push your body. And that was something that other dancers taught me just because when I watched them, I, I, I realized how little I did and how much more I have to bring to the table. It's fascinating. I think it's also inspiring for, for other dancers who are watching you and listening to you speak. Uh, very inspiring, gives good perspective to the career. Well, on the brighter, on the a lighter side, um, what dancer or choreographer would you like to interview? From the past, let's say some 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 dancer or choreographer from the past. Who would you like to interview? I'd like to interview from the past. Well, Balanchine for sure. Um, Balanchine. I would like to know how Petipa choreographed all of these classical ballets, and his sort of interaction with the musicians like Tchaikovsky and. And, and oh, I mean, choreographer, um, Agra, Agrabina Vaganova, for sure, just because she's an, also an educator. And I would really like, actually she would be my most fascinating interview person because she was also a choreographer, phenomenal dancer herself. And she was educator that sort of flipped a coin on classical dance and just elevated it, especially in female dance of being able to make the female dancers jump really high. And that understanding of where did all that knowledge come from? Where did she discover? Where did she took all this um, decorating arms away and added this like dynamic arm movements into jumps? And how did she arrive in that conclusion? I, I just, I would love to interview her, yeah. Were you trained in the Vaganova technique in Estonia? Yes, yes. And um, yeah, it, it was always just a mystery to me because a lot of the times, even as a student, I was thinking when teachers would say, well, you have to really push this hill forward and then you turn up that back leg and you're supposed to be balancing. And as a kid, I would think to myself thinking, that's impossible, that's impossible. And, and these teachers would say, no, it just takes years of practice. And this is what we learned of Vaganova. And, and then you look at Vaganova's old writings, you also see all of that. And it's, it's just fascinating. It's fascinating what our bodies are able to do when it seems, seems impossible. On that, on that note, uh, let's say you've had a hard day of rehearsal and uh, you're really, really low on energy and you have a performance that night. What's your 
go-to energy food? What do you eat to perk yourself up and get yourself ready to perform? Mm -hmm. I try to go with something. Um, I love sandwiches, but uh, <laughs> I try to go with something. So if there is a sandwich, it's got to have some kind of vegetable or something green in it. And, uh, and usually I, 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 I like like even vegetarian um, um, sandwiches, but let's say if I if I dance if I dance a ballet like a Swan Lake or Chiselle, then I stay away from sandwich and I have I have usually some kind of pasta that's very light, not heavy, so no cream, and usually like a pasta or a pesto or any kind of pasta that's sort of plain. And, uh, and uh, for breakfast that day, I tried to always um, have an oatmeal because it's a very long lasting energy source. It releases slowly and the pasta does the same thing so that I don't hit uh, my low during the time that I will be dancing. And most of the time when you be dancing is you probably, it was so funny. I, I, I remember this so vividly thinking we were doing Swan Lake and it was edging towards 9.45 and I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna be doing my solo soon. And my body is, you know, your brain starts producing melatonin around eight o'clock, you know, it starts to slow you down. Usually your heart rate goes up. And so you start feeling like, like sort of like panicky. And uh, because your body is starting to get you prepared for sleep. Your brain is starting to get you prepared for sleep, but yet you have to have all this adrenaline. So it's really hard to balance that. And with pasta, you can certainly do that because it just gives you that kind of long lasting energy. Well, has there ever been something that happened on stage that went very wrong? Something funny, maybe not, not disastrous. And how did you uh, handle it? Uh, I've actually been really fortunate. I, I'm kind of like a cat. I always just land on my feet. Doesn't matter which way you throw me. I just always land on my feet and maybe not pretty always, but, um, you know, I have slipped an occasion or, but somehow I always just sort of land on my feet or at least on my hands. I can't recall really anything super disastrous. Oh, yes, actually, I do have, I do have a, a one incident. So we were doing in the upper room, Twyla Tharps in the upper room with the Birmingham Royal Ballet. And we were on tour and we were performing on a raked stage that was raked down. And that was unusual for us because uh, we always had flat stages. And in that particular tour, they, they used uh, fog because the ballet, I don't know if you've seen it, but this ballet is full of fog and beautiful Jennifer Tipton lighting, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And, and they were using this fog and the fog machine leaked oil onto the stage because they were on the sides. So some dancer had walked in front of the fog machine. Now the point shoes were covered in oil and that dancer brought that oil onto the stage. And in my solo, I had to run from upstage doing this um, very fast entrance when I slide into the corner. And because it was raked, my foot just came off the ground and I slid all the way off the stage into the wing underneath the stage manager's feet. <laughs> all the way crashed underneath her feet. And within like split second, I was back on the stage. But that's the only time I've just like sort of disappeared into the fog, into the, into the wing and just jumped right back up. I don't think the audience noticed. They would just think that was inventive choreography. <laughs> oh my God. I think they noticed because I'm a big guy. You noticed when I crashed into the wing. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time, but I wonder if you have some final words for the for the viewers, for all the people that miss you terribly. Well, I I miss I miss our audience. I really do miss. I miss hearing the applause. I I just watched a show of opening night show of the Midsummer Night Dreams, and just hearing you all cheer out there and clap, and um, it's it's 
that's what we live for. That's what we enjoy. That's, that's why we dance. We dance to share our art form with you and bring you on a journey and, you know, release you for a couple of hours from the daily routine and make you believe that there is magic and alternate universe and just share it with you all. So I miss you a lot. And I, I really hope that you can support San Francisco Valley and, and uh, look at all these wonderful interviews and uh, share their content. And uh, we'll be back soon. We'll be back and we'll be back stronger. Thank you so much, Teet, for the interview and for your inspiring artistry. It's always a pleasure to watch you on stage. And to our viewers, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you.